I'm Danielle with Put a Finish on It. If you're a writer looking for an editor, let me know. Speaking of editing, I've been working on a very interesting manuscript lately, which is why I'm so late with my wrap up. I completed seven books in August. The first one was another adoption memoir, the last in the stack I had checked out from the library in July. A World of Love by Maggie Conroy from 1997. I really enjoyed this one because this couple wanted to adopt a girl so their daughter would have a sister, and they got a bunk bed for her room and they were ready. They ended up adopting three girls, as so often happens, and it was a well-told story. Next was Matilda Bone by Karen Cushman from 2000. I've read several other novels by Karen Cushman, and it turns out this one was my least favorite. This young girl was raised by a priest and knows how to read and write and recite the lives of the saints, but there was no happiness in her life, no joy, which was sinful. I liked the idea, but it was a little too heavy-handed, a little repetitious, and it took a little too long for Matilda to break free of her misguided upbringing. I do recommend Catherine Called Birdie and The Midwife's Apprentice by Karen Cushman. Then I read Wish You Happy Forever by Jenny Bowen, published in 2014. This is the story of how Jenny and her husband were moved to adopt two girls from China after having already raised a couple of kids. From that experience, Jenny realized that something had to change in the way that China was caring for its orphans, and she founded Half the Sky. It's an incredible account of someone who was determined to make a difference. Someone who didn't have any knowledge of China or Chinese or early childhood education, but who knew how to get the right people on board and how to start something from nothing. I found this book really engaging, both as a helping the world's most vulnerable story and as a story of working toward amazing success in the face of incredible obstacles. I really recommend this one, especially if you have the idea of starting something of your own and you're looking for inspiration. Then I finally read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. It was published in 1970, it was her first book, and it won the Nobel Prize. I've only ever read one other Morrison, Sula, back in college. I felt much more prepared this time, having lived more and learned more, and having a better understanding of what institutionalized racism and internalized race prejudice mean. So I understood the novel, I got it, but I can't say that I liked it or enjoyed it. The structure was very distancing for me. The story opens in first person with somebody looking back on her childhood and remembering Pickle of Breed Love, who was raped and became pregnant by her father. But the novel keeps pulling back and opening each chapter with the story of a different character without stating outright who that character is. It's revealed slowly with that character's background and upbringing, so you get to understand how they came to be who they are. The parents, a neighbor, a pervert in the town. So the bluest eye isn't Piccola's story or the occasional first person narrator's story, but the story of a whole town, a whole time and place. The way it kept pulling back from the present to tell another person's past kept me distant and disconnected from the story. In the afterword, written 20 years after it's first published, Morrison reveals that she's not satisfied with the structure either. So that's something. Was the book powerful and well written? Yes. Absolutely. I recommend that you read, if you haven't yet, The Color Purple by Alice Walker. Interestingly, it opens the exact same way with a young girl raped and pregnant by her father. But Celie's story really is Celie's story, and she's the one to tell it. I felt connected to her immediately and missed her when the story was over. I had to follow the blue side with something light, and I chose Dear Mom, You're Ruining My Life by Jean Van Leeuwen from 1989. This one is a very dated account of being 12 and having to dance with boys. Next I read The Zookeeper's Wife, A War Story by Diane Ackerman from 2008. I thought this one was going to be fiction, but upon further inspection I saw that it is a true story, based on a Warsaw couple's journals and letters and lots and lots of primary documents. It reads partly like a memoir, only not told by the people that it's about, and partly like straight nonfiction, so it was often difficult to get into. But I've never read anything like it. In the 30s, there was an incredible Warsaw Zoo, which was run by this Polish couple, the Sabinskis, who lived in a villa on the zoo ground. The story opens with the German bombing of Warsaw and continues through the end of the war. I hadn't ever read a complete account of wartime from the point of view of a non-Jewish Polish family. How terrifying and uncertain everything was just for regular civilians. The Zabinskis were in a unique position because they were able to keep operating the zoo by turning it into a pig farm to feed the German army. And Jan Zabinski was able to go into the Warsaw Ghetto and sneak food in, and eventually sneak people out. And they hid the people 
in the buildings on the zoo grounds until they were able to move them to a safer location. The book also goes into the goals that the Nazis had of backbreeding or like reverse engineering the specific breeds of bison and wild horse for the glory of Germany, getting back to its pure roots. So the book did take some fascinating and disturbing detours, but the Zabinski story was incredible and I'm glad I read it. The last book I completed in August was Fragments, Memories of a Wartime Childhood by Benjamin Wilkmerski from 1995. This was the story of snatches of memory from a boy who was very young when he survived the Holocaust. In 1998, it came out that the boy was in fact not a Holocaust survivor at all. Turns out that I read an excerpt from this book in college when I took a course on the Holocaust in memory. But I didn't realize it until I got to that part in the book and I was like, hey, this is that story that ended up being completely made up. It's fascinating because the author actually believes the story. He would have been only four when the war ended. He'd read survivor accounts extensively until he constructed this past for himself that he actually believed. His memories are actually quite visceral and effective. And it made me think about the real child survivors of the Holocaust who were young enough that existence in the camps were their earliest memories and what kind of effect that had on the rest of their lives. As for the author, it's interesting to think about his need to co-opt others' experiences to explain his own early childhood traumas. If you're interested in faux memoirs and controversy, how about this one, though it's now out of print. And those are all seven books I finished reading in August. Thanks for watching.